Hi, my name is Tess Hartley, and I just want to welcome you today to the knee and hip replacement online class for Baptist Ambulatory Surgery Center. I am the clinical educator at the surgery center, as well as one of our joint replacement coordinators. So today we'll be talking about knee and hip replacement, how to prepare for surgery, what to expect on the day of surgery, and how to have a successful recovery at home. So your surgeon has chosen to do your surgery at Baptist Ambulatory Surgery Center here with us. Our mission statement is to treat each and every one of our patients and their families as if they were our very own family member. And I will tell you as a personal testament to that, I have been a part of the entire process and seen how our staff treats you while you're here, including even in the operating room. And those individuals are so careful and so particular about this surgery specifically. So you're very special here to us, and we're so glad that you have worked with your surgeon to come and be with us. So first things first. You've got this. This video is going to cover everything that you need to know, and you're going to have access to your joint replacement coordinators as things go on. So the first thing we want to look at is your support system. Do you have family and friends that can care for you? You do have to have someone with you for the first few days anyway, so it's likely that you've got at least one person that you can depend on to drive you to and from physical therapy sessions and make sure that you're taking your medications appropriately after surgery. Also within your support system is the joint replacement coordinator. We are here for you if you ever have any questions before surgery, after surgery, you can call or text us. Our information has been sent to you via this email that you received the video in, so feel free to contact us if you ever need anything. Now, that being said, please be respectful when you call us. Poor examples would be somebody texting me five weeks after surgery and saying, I just ate some turkey jerky and now I feel weird. Is that normal? That's not an appropriate question. So just make sure that you stick specifically to your knee or your hip and we'll do just fine. I'm always good with you sending pictures of your incision if you're concerned about it and those types of things. In addition to that, we will call you on a regular basis. Typically, the first two days after surgery, we'll give you a call just to check in on you. And then we also call around the one week mark, two weeks, a month, and three months out just to make sure everything's going smoothly. At the same time, I expect you to communicate with us and let us know if you're having any problems. A lot of times we can help you prevent smaller problems from growing into bigger problems. So risks and benefits of outpatient joint replacement surgery. There are several good things about this. Um, you're not going into the hospital you're not going to be around sick people, so there is less risk of infection. You also get to go home and be in your own environment, sleep in your own bed. That reduced stress does help promote the healing process. The biggest downside to outpatient surgery is that if something does happen, you don't have a doctor or nurse right there with you to help you. But that's where your support system comes in. You've got your family or loved ones that are helping to care for you, who have hopefully listened to this information as well. And then you've also got us that you can depend on. We're always here for you if you need anything. Also, your surgeon's office should have a surgeon that is on call 24 hours. So God forbid something happens at 2 a.m. and you have to get in contact with someone immediately, you can call them at that number. Let's talk about preparing for surgery. So the first thing is preparing your home and planning how to navigate around your home. Now, don't be afraid of the length of time it takes for us to go through the next couple of slides. This is the longest portion of the class. However, it's that way because I want you to be safe and I don't want you to fall. 
just some general tips. You do want to clear a path through your house to make sure your walker can fit in and out of all of the spaces that it needs to fit through. You will be using a walker after surgery, at least for the first several days, if not the first few weeks. Also make sure you find your nest, so to speak. So you want to find that area where you're going to be hanging out for the first several days. A lot of times this will be a recliner or your bed. You just want to make sure that it's in a good position where you're not having to go up and down stairs to get to the bathroom and that sort of thing. And that you've also gathered everything around that area the night before surgery. So you've got all of your chargers and any other things that you will need right next to you. Another thing is to create a safety plan before surgery. We don't want you to trying to figure everything out as far as getting on and off the toilet and figuring out how to walk with the walker. You don't want to be doing those things for the first time when you're drunk from the anesthesia. So it's good to practice these things before and have a plan in mind. In regards to the walker, I want you to think of it as more of a safety device than an assistive device. And what I mean by that is this. Immediately after surgery, you will be able to put your full weight on that operative leg. We want you to do that, and it's good for you to do that. The walker is simply there in case you get some sudden weakness, and also if you need a little extra support. So the day after surgery, you may have a little more pain than you had the day before. Definitely take some pressure off of that hip or knee by using the walker. But as a general rule, you're going to walk pretty normally. The walker is just there to make sure that you don't fall and that you have support there if you need it. As far as adjusting the walker, if you are coming into the center to get your lab work done, your joint coordinator will adjust your walker for you. So either bring your walker with you when you come or we can provide you with one. You want to adjust it so that you have a slight bend in your arms when you're standing straight up. I don't want you hunched over like a little old granny um, and I don't want it, you know, way up close to your shoulders either. Make sure when you walk with the walker that you stay inside of your rectangle. And if you look on the screen here, you can see what I mean by that rectangle. Your toes need to stay inside those four points at all times. So when you walk, you're going to go out with the walker to about the edge of your toes before you take any step. And then you're going to step forward with your bad leg first. We always do bad leg first when we're walking. So you'll step through with your bad leg, and then your good leg, which is your non-operative leg, is going to follow. When you're making turns, avoid any awkward twisting of the joint. So move your walker without moving your body. Angle your walker to the right if you're turning right. And then you're going to move your bad leg first. And you kind of move your whole body when you're doing that, just so you're not doing any weird twisting there. The biggest thing is practice, practice, practice. Again, I don't want you trying to figure this out when you have been under the influence. So make sure that you have practiced it even just for 60 seconds. That alone will create a muscle memory and will help you do well on the day of surgery. Now let's talk about transitions. Usually, if I see someone that's going to fall, which is always a risk after a big surgery like this, it's usually not when they're walking. Most of the time, it happens either when they're going to sit down or when they go to stand up. So it's really important that you understand how to do that correctly and hopefully that you will practice it before you come in. So when you go to sit down with the walker, you want to confirm your destination, which means you are going to back up with that walker until your legs are touching the destination. When you are going to sit down with the walker, say for example you're going to sit in a chair, you're going to back up very slowly with the walker until you feel that chair with the back of your leg so that you know that you're there and you're not going to accidentally sit down on the edge. Before you move, I want you to take three seconds and identify what will be the most stable handhold for you to make that transition. 
Usually if it's a chair, it's going to be the armrests. So you're going to grab that armrest with one hand while you're holding onto the walker. And then you'll reach down with your other hand, grab the other armrest, and then sit yourself down very slowly. Now I don't want you to plop down. Plopping down can cause extra pain. If you're not careful and you haven't completely gotten to your destination, you might plop down on the edge of your seat and then fall in the floor, which is going to delay your recovery significantly and possibly cause additional injury. Now, when you go to stand up, similar in the way that you do your hand holds, but I want you to take it slowly. A lot of times after surgery, people can get dizzy when they stand up too fast. Because of the type of anesthesia that we give you, you are going to be even more prone to dizziness during that first 24-hour period. So when you go to stand up, I want you to just stand there for a second. Don't take off. Don't walk away. Just make sure that you feel steady and that you're not lightheaded. Another example of this would be, let's say it's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're in bed. You need to get up and use the bathroom. Well, first of all, if it's that first night, wake your partner. They need to be up and walking with you for the first 24 hours to make sure you don't fall. When you go to get up to go to the bathroom, you're going to sit up on the side of the bed and just sit there for a couple of minutes. Sudden changes like that can cause a drop in your blood pressure, especially in the first 24 hours, and cause you to get dizzy, and I don't want you to fall. If you feel okay sitting on the side of the bed, then you can go ahead and stand up. Just stand up for a couple of minutes, make sure you're not lightheaded or woozy, and then you can walk towards the bathroom with your support person standing there with you. Some other important points when we're getting around at home after surgery and how to prepare is to know how we're going to use the bathroom, how to shower, how to use the toilet. So for men, it's kind of easy, right? If you pee standing up, then you can just simply walk up to the toilet, put that walker over top of the toilet so you'll have good handholds and then you're good to go. So when you're going to sit down on the toilet, it's really important that you identify good handholds. Like for me, I have a sink right next to my toilet. When I go to sit down, I could hold on to that sink if I want to. You may have something similar to that in your home. If you don't, they do make things called raised toilet seats. And raised toilet seats are especially helpful for hip patients. Sitting down into lower areas can be challenging after hip replacement. Some raised toilet seats also have handlebars on each side of the toilet, so that is another benefit of getting that. I'll give you some more information about a raised toilet seat in the next few slides. As a last resort, you can simply take the walker and place that walker over top of the toilet, slowly turn yourself around, and then sit down using the walker as handholds on both sides of you. For showering, you will have a water-resistant dressing over your incision after surgery. So usually I recommend waiting at least two days after surgery so that you have your sea legs back, so to speak. However, you do need to sit down for these showers. Showering creates a high risk for falling. You've got slippery conditions in the tub. You've taken pain medicine, you've got a weak knee or a weak hip, and then when that hot water hits you, it can make you kind of lightheaded. So it's important that you do have a way to sit down. Now they do make shower chairs specifically for that. You could also use a stool, lawn chair, bar stool, I don't care what it is, as long as it will sit in there and it's not going to be unstable when you sit on it. If you're unable to find a way to sit down in the shower, you can always just take a sink bath until you feel comfortable enough to stand up in the shower. I would recommend that your support person be with you for that first shower just to make sure that you're stable. A few other points for navigation planning and then we'll be finished with this portion of the class. So stairs are always a big concern for people after hip and knee replacement. 
Now with stairs, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach. So remember when we were walking with the walker, I said you will always lead with your bad leg. So your bad leg will always go first. That is not the case when we do stairs. Now one really important thing is you want to make sure that you have good support on both sides. So having a rail, you can actually use your walker for a little extra support, fold it up and placed on the steps, or you can have somebody with you. Um, and I would actually encourage that even if you do have rails on both sides. Remember to always take stairs one step at a time. I want you to take one step and then stop. Take one step and then stop. The most important thing to remember is good leg up, bad leg down. An easy way to remember it, good leg goes up to heaven and bad leg goes down, right? It's important that you actually practice that. We will make sure that you are able to do stairs before you leave the surgery center on surgery day. Uh, but it is very important to practice that and make sure you're doing it correctly. Just a few more short points. So you don't want anything underfoot, especially that first time when you come into your home after surgery. What I would recommend is that your support person goes inside and puts them in their crate or in a back room, and then they get you into the house. Please do not let your pet lick your incision. And then lastly, let's talk about driving and riding in the car. If you've had a left hip or a left knee replacement, You'll have to check with your surgeon specifically, but it's usually okay to drive once you have been off pain medication for 24 hours. Now, if you've had a right hip or a right knee replacement, you have to be cleared by your surgeon. I know it doesn't feel like you require a lot of force to hit the brakes, but it really does require a lot more strength than perhaps we would think. So it is very unsafe for you to do that when you are not quite strong enough. When you are riding in a vehicle, when you go to get in the car, again, you want to identify your handholds, just like when you go to sit down in a chair or on the toilet or what have you. So you're going to use that walker to walk up to the door. Someone will open the door for you. And then you're going to turn yourself around. You're going to grab onto the door itself and then some type of handhold inside the car. And you'll slowly sit down bottom first. And then you'll swing your legs into the vehicle. When you're getting out, it's the reverse. You're going to swing your legs out, grab your handholds, and then you're going to stand up. You can see on this next slide how you would go up and down stairs. Now this is assuming that the right leg is the bad leg. Again, just make sure that you're practicing this. If you are coming into the surgery center to get lab work done and want to practice with one of our joint replacement coordinators, let us know and we'll be happy to do that with you. We do have a little set of physical therapy steps that we can practice on. So we've talked a lot about moving around at home. What is the safest way to navigate around your home? And I've kind of mentioned a couple of things that could be helpful as you practice and as you go through moving around after surgery. So I put together a list of helpful medical equipment. First of all, a walker. Obviously, you're going to need a walker after surgery. It doesn't matter if you're 35 years old and have a hip replacement. I still want you to have a walker. It's the very safest thing for you to have at the beginning. When you're looking for a walker, we can provide you with one at the surgery center if you do not have one. But if you have one at home already or if you're looking at buying one, just a couple of tips my preference is the walker that has no wheels on it. It's just four points on the ground. Now, Dr. Burton does like his patients to have the wheeled walker if possible. However, if you try that out and you're uncomfortable with it, we will certainly give you the regular walker instead. 
you cannot use a walker that has wheels on all four points. That is just not the safest thing to do. With things like a rollator, you can't keep that walker close enough to you and you may not be coordinated enough to hit the brakes if you start to feel weakness. So I need something that is going to be more stable. So no rollators or walkers with more than two wheels. As you get stronger, you will very likely transition to a cane. So it's important that you look into this. We do have canes at the surgery center. You can also borrow some or buy one off Amazon or whatever you would like to do. And occasionally I'll get someone that says they didn't even need a cane, but I would say 98% of our joint patients do need a cane to transition off of the walker once they're ready. Your physical therapist can help you understand when it is time to transition to that cane. Just make sure that you are communicating with them. So a walker is always required. The cane usually you're going to use. And then the next several things are just going to be optional. A raised toilet seat I mentioned before, that can really help if your bathroom does not have good handholds to sit down with. If you have one of those low toilets and you're having hip surgery, it is almost a necessity to have that raised toilet seat because it's going to be very hard for you to get up off of that toilet. So you can certainly look into that. They do sell them on Amazon. I can provide links to various medical equipment upon request. So please let me know if you need help finding anything. Shower chairs are also great, but if you've got a stool that's going to fit in there and you can sit on it and it's not going to slip and slide around everywhere, that's perfectly fine as well. Another thing is an ice machine. We can provide these for patients whose surgeon is from TOA. And if you are a knee replacement, I highly recommend that you get an ice machine. These can really, really help with the healing process. For those of you who do want the surgery center to provide you one, I want you to keep in mind that sometimes insurance will cover it and sometimes they will not. If you are concerned about that, call your insurance company and ask them if the ice machine is covered. If it is not covered, you can speak with me about pricing and you can either decide if you would like for us to go ahead and give it to you and you just pay the price that is listed or you can look at other places for buying something similar. In addition to the benefits that this provides you for your knee replacement, this ice machine can be used for a multitude of other injuries and surgeries. So, for example, this exact device will also work for shoulder surgeries. You can also get a hip attachment, and you can see that pictured there on the slide. Now, I don't recommend it for hips because a lot of times you can just use a big ice pack and get the same effect. However, they really are a good investment if you anticipate other surgeries within your household or within your family. Please notify your joint coordinator of what you want to do regarding ice machines. If you're a hip replacement, I'm not going to give you one unless you ask me for one. But for knee replacement, I need you to let me know Yes, I do want an ice machine from you guys. I already have an ice machine and I will be bringing that on the day of surgery. Or, no, I do not want an ice machine. I will use an ice pack at home. And that's important because some doctors will just assume that you want it. But I like to give you that option so you know what you're paying for in advance. Just a couple other quick medical devices that can be helpful. A grabber can be helpful, and you can see pictured here what I consider a grabber. It can just be really handy uh, to make sure that you're being safe and that you're not going to fall. Another handy device that I have found is this car door handle. Now, you can buy these on Amazon for like $10, 
It hooks into this little metal piece on the inside of your door. I don't know what that's called. But it hooks inside of there, and it's really nice because it provides an extra handhold for you when you go to get up out of the car. So consider that. It's, it's pretty cheap, and I feel that it's a good investment. So again, if you want links to any of the medical equipment that we went over today, please let me know, and I'll be happy to help you with that. So again, that was the longest part of the class. If we got through that, the rest of it's going to be a breeze. Other ways that we are preparing for surgery, it's really important that you prepare your body for surgery. It can be very helpful for you to eat a healthy diet before surgery, help make sure that your body is able to heal itself. For people who consume nicotine, either by smoking, vaping, nicotine does delay wound healing, so I want you to keep that in mind. I've probably already had a conversation with you about this when we initially talked, but typically when you're going to have surgery and have a major stress on your body, it's not necessarily the best time to quit cold turkey, but if you can wean yourself down or perhaps smoke half of what you did before, every little bit helps. If you need more information or help on how to quit smoking, please let me know and I can provide that for you. Some other things to prepare your body are strengthening exercises. I am sending you a list of exercises that we have. These exercises can be helpful in strengthening up both your bad leg and your good leg, and it helps you kind of get a leg up on the competition, pun intended. So I recommend doing them twice a day, every day leading up until surgery, and doing both legs. Now, if you get to an exercise that's super painful, don't do it, okay? Just do the ones that you can. Again, it's not a critical thing, but it can be helpful. Let's talk about medications. So there are medications that we want you to stop one week prior to surgery. These include all anti-inflammatory medications, and usually you'll see the word NSAID written on the bottle. So that includes ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, Meloxicam, Mobic, Diclofenac. This is not a complete list of anti-inflammatories, but I'm going to notify you of any specific medications that I want you to stop if they're not on that list. Now, some people, I will tell you to stop aspirin before surgery. If you are a patient that has a cardiac history, so you've had maybe a heart attack in the past, or you've had to have a stent placed, or anything like that, I may have you stay on your aspirin leading up until surgery day. So make sure that you have gotten that information from me and that you've looked for that information and know what you're supposed to do. We also want you to stop vitamins and supplements one week prior to surgery. And then as far as actual blood thinners, these include things like Coumadin, Warfarin, Plavix, Eliquis. You must be cleared by your prescriber to stop that medication. I will have that clearance in your paperwork, so I will let you know, again, what medication to stop, and when to stop it. And that may be different than one week. Sometimes it's just three days before surgery that we want you to stop it. Now, other than the medications listed on this page, I want you to continue taking all of your other regular medication, unless I tell you differently, up until surgery day. So that means the day before surgery, Take everything as normal still. So if you have blood pressure medicines, allergy medicine, cholesterol medicine, diabetes medicine, take everything the same way that you normally would. Just stop these medicines that are listed here. The morning of surgery, you will avoid certain medications. Again, I will provide you a list of what medicines you do need to take that morning, but this is just a general overview of medications that we usually will tell you to not take. Again, just the morning of surgery. For example, if you take lisinopril every morning, I want you to take your lisinopril the day before surgery, but I'll want you to not take it the morning of surgery. And again, you will have that written out for you. 
Now, there is a medication called Flomax that I will actually call into your pharmacy for you to take before surgery, if appropriate. So it is given to all men above age 50 that still has a prostate. This is all taken before surgery. Flomax is a medication that helps you to be able to urinate after surgery. As men get older, they have increased problems with being able to urinate. And so this medication helps with that. There will be only three pills when I call this into your pharmacy. And I have also attached that schedule to this email as well. Also before surgery, we want to make sure that your skin is as clean as it can be. So if you are coming in to bask to have your labs drawn, we will give you a goodie bag at that time. And in that goodie bag will be this special CHG soap. CHG stands for chlorhexidine gluconate, and it's just a special soap that helps reduce the bacteria on your skin and helps to prevent infection. You're going to use this before surgery. Do not use it after surgery. The chemicals can sometimes break down the adhesive of what's holding your incision closed. So if it's a special glue, that CHG can actually interfere with that. So this is only before surgery to help prep your skin. Basic instructions, you're going to shower normally with dial soap. And then right before you would normally get out of the shower, you're going to apply that CHG soap all over and around the operative site. So if you're going to be having hip replacement, you're going to actually start in your hip area. The incision will be right on the front of your hip, and you'll scrub that area, and then you're going to kind of go out from that area in circles. I want you to do a pretty large area. I want you to go like halfway up your chest and all the way down to your knee. I want you to go around the back and get your bottom, get into all the crevices. You don't want to get it on your genitals, but make sure that you are getting into all those spaces that can be sweaty or harbor bacteria. Let that soap sit for a couple of minutes and then rinse it off. When you get out of the shower, don't rub dry with a towel. Just pat dry. There may be a little bit of a film on your skin, and that's normal. We don't want to rub that off. A couple of other showering notes. Do not shave the operative area. There is a risk if you use a razor of you nicking yourself, and that can be an area where bacteria can be introduced and potentially give you an infection prior to surgery after you start doing the CHG, you're going to use a clean towel, get into clean clothes, and use clean sheets. No creams or lotions below your waist after you've started these showers. I have written the specific dates and times of day that you're going to be doing these showers, and I have attached it to the email where you got this video, so please refer to that. But basically, you're going to shower two nights before surgery, the night before surgery, and then the morning of surgery. And once again, only use this soap before surgery. After your last shower, I would recommend putting the soap up in a cabinet somewhere or just throwing it away so you don't accidentally use it again. It is really important that you prepare your support person for this process. Make sure that they have access to this video and that they're able to watch it, if at all possible. If they're not able to watch the whole thing, make sure that they watch the last section of the video where we talk about how to have a successful recovery because they're going to be a part of that with you. The other biggest thing is make sure that you communicate times with them. So again, I attached that sheet to this email where you got the video, and that sheet has all of your times, like what time to arrive and what time surgery starts and what time we think surgery will end, what time we think you're going to be discharged. It's important that your support person has those expectations so they aren't confused about the process and they know what to expect. We're almost done talking about preparing for surgery, but let's talk for a few minutes about infection risk. 
So either when you come in to see us at BASC or if you're going to an outside facility to get this done, we will do a MRSA or MRSA nasal swab screening. MRSA is a really bad bug that is resistant to a lot of the antibiotics that we have. So it can be very, very dangerous if that reaches your new hip or your new knee. Some people acquire this MRSA in their nose through the community. Typically, you won't have any symptoms and it won't cause any problems. Now, if you do have MRSA in your nose, there is a risk that once you have a major implant put into your body, that MRSA could travel to that new implant. So we want to be really, really careful. One of our precautionary measures is whether you're positive or negative for the screening, we do use a special medicated nose swab in your nose on the day of surgery that helps repress any MRSA that's in there for a certain number of hours. Now, if you are positive for the MRSA, I will prescribe you a special ointment that you will use in your nose for five days, and then we'll also give you a really, really strong antibiotic in pre-op to help make sure that we're keeping you safe. Even after surgery, as you move forward, it's important to consider your risk of infection. It takes years for your body to accept that implant, so you are at an increased risk of infection to that site for a few years after surgery. If you were to scratch your arm after surgery and it starts to get infected, your body will recognize, hey, we have an infection here in the arm. I really hate that implant. Let's send that infection over there. So it is important that you communicate with your doctors if you do think you have a potential infection like that. It's also important that you take antibiotics prior to any type of procedure. And that includes things like dental appointments, oral surgery, colonoscopies, or any other bigger surgeries that you can think of. Anytime that they are doing a procedure, you're going to need to take antibiotics for a few days prior to surgery. Sometimes the practitioner who is doing the procedure or providing services will prescribe that for you. But if they say that it is not necessary or that they don't do that, please contact your surgeon's office and they will take care of that for you. As far as the timing and how long you'll have to do that, it's going to vary depending on your surgeon's preference, but usually it's a few years. So make sure that you're talking to your surgeon about that. It's a good question to bring up at your first follow-up appointment. The last big thing to talk about in preparing for surgery is setting up physical therapy. It is crucial that you set up your physical therapy appointment before you have surgery and that you have a plan in mind. Most patients are going to require physical therapy after surgery. Exceptions to that, I believe that Dr. Sarb's hip replacement patients are not required to have physical therapy, and there may be a few others that won't require that. However, if at any point you feel that you need physical therapy, you can always contact your physician. They should be able to get that order over to your physical therapist office. Typically, your first physical therapy session is going to be one to two days after surgery. I recommend two days just so that first day you can figure out your pain medication and just kind of get your bearings before you go in and have therapy. But it is extremely important that you do go to therapy, that you do your exercises, and that you do what you're supposed to do. That's going to help ensure that you have a successful recovery. Now, sometimes your surgeon will schedule physical therapy for you already. If you don't already have an appointment, a few days before surgery, call your surgeon's nurse and let them know what physical therapy place you would like to use and request that they send an order over to that place. 
This slide just shows a timeline of what needs to be done prior to surgery. Pause the video if you need to to read through this slide, but it can be helpful in showing you just in a little bit of a different way when and what you're supposed to do. Our second section of the class is surgery day and what to expect. So first you will come to the surgery center and check in with the front desk. Make sure that you refer to your checklist that I provided in your email. Nothing to eat after midnight. You can actually have clear liquids up until two hours prior to surgery start time. And that is listed on your paperwork, so make sure that you read the correct time. After the time that is listed, absolutely nothing in your mouth. No mints or gum, water, candy, or anything like that. It is really important that you drink your Powerade or Gatorade prior to surgery. If you come in to BASC to get your lab work done, we will provide you with a Powerade while you're here. But you can really do any flavor of Powerade or Gatorade as long as the color is not red. So do not drink any red Powerade or Gatorade. Your arrival time is usually one and a half to two hours prior to the surgery start time, and that just makes sure that we can get you fully prepared for surgery and that you're ready to roll at your appointed time. Things to bring to the surgery center, you want to bring your photo ID, insurance card, and any type of copay if you owe one. Now, even if you don't owe a copay, you still need to bring your photo ID and your insurance card with you when you come. Typically, they will call you five to seven days prior to your surgery and let you know what you owe. The surgery center bill will have to be paid when you get here to the surgery center. You'll also want to wear loose pants, shorts, or a skirt or dress. Something that is going to be loose and comfortable, something like sweatpants, pajama pants, or those basketball shorts. Bring some tennis shoes or some type of shoe that has good grip on the bottom and a back to it. If you wear glasses or dentures, please bring your case with you. And if you use an inhaler, bring that as well. When you come to get your lab work drawn with us, we will provide you with a walker so that you can practice with it. I want you to bring that walker back with you so we can observe you walking after surgery and make sure that that walker is adjusted properly for you. If you are having your labs done elsewhere and you don't have a walker, we will provide you with one on surgery day or if you're bringing one from home. Just make sure that if you do have a walker that you bring it on surgery day. If you purchased an ice machine, bring that with you. If you did not purchase an ice machine and do want one or do not want one, please let your nurse know if you are a knee replacement. If you're a hip replacement, it's not necessary to talk with us about this, but knee replacements specifically, you do need to let your nurse know once they've brought you to pre-op, or you can text me in advance and let me know what your decision is, and I'll put that information on the chart. Avoid bringing expensive items like jewelry, cash, electronics, that kind of stuff. We are not liable for things that get lost while you're here with us at the surgery center. So once you're all checked in, they will bring you back to the preoperative area. At the time that I'm making this recording, we do not let family members come back to the pre-op area initially but sometimes we will let family members come back right before you go back to surgery to let them see you before you enter the operating room. Once you get to the pre-op area, you'll sign your consent form with your nurse, which does provide consent for us to do the surgery, but is also a safety measure. We want to make sure that we're doing the safest thing possible for you, and that's gonna include verifying the procedure, who you are, what kind of body part we're doing, which side it's on. We're trying to do all of those things and verify all of those things frequently so that we are doing the very safest thing for you. You will be given several medications as well, 
and it's listed there for you. But we do give you several things to prevent issues during surgery and after surgery as well. Once you've signed your consent and taken your medications, the nurse will get your blood pressure, oxygen level, temperature. You will then have to change into a gown. For both hip and knee replacement, you will need to remove your underwear and you may be asked to put on an adult diaper that's just a pull-up. Now, this can seem demeaning at first, but I promise you this is for your dignity and safety. And I can explain it better a little bit later in this video. But one of the more obvious uses for that is we won't have to use a catheter during surgery. And we'll still be able to keep your incision clean and dry. You will then meet with one of our anesthesia doctors. They'll discuss the anesthesia plan and also put your IV in. Now, our anesthesia doctors here are wonderful. They all have many, many years of experience and do a great job. And I would trust them to provide anesthesia for me if I needed this procedure. So you'll be in excellent hands. If you are having knee replacement, we will do a nerve block on that knee. So let me explain what that is. Basically, a nerve block is an injection of numbing medication next to the nerve that controls feeling in about half of your knee. So the nerve block will still be done in the preoperative area, so you're not in the operating room yet. First, the nurse will make sure you're hooked up to our monitor so we can monitor you closely. And then they're going to give you some sedating medicines. So you may or may not remember what happens after this, and that is completely normal. Even if you do remember what happens, you're going to be very much chilled out. So you will be comfortable during the procedure. Once you've been sedated, the anesthesiologist will take the ultrasound machine and identify the nerve in the top of your leg that controls feeling on the inside of your knee. Once they have identified that nerve, they're going to inject numbing medicine next to that area. What that does is it numbs up the inside of your knee for about 24 hours. That helps to reduce your pain level immediately after surgery and also helps you to be able to get home and get on your home pain medicine and get the medicine in your system before this nerve block wears off. So it really helps you to have a better transition into going home. Final preparations before you go into the operating room, you will get to meet with your surgeon. This is a good time to ask any last minute questions that you have and to discuss any pain medications. Make sure that they know what pharmacy you need your medicine sent to. It's always going to be whatever pharmacy you told them in the office. I recommend that you write down any questions that you do have for your surgeon the night before surgery and you bring that list with you so that you're able to ask everything you need to ask. It can be challenging sometimes when that surgeon comes up to talk to you because you're nervous and you will forget things. Your surgeon will also mark the area that is to be operated on just as an additional safety precaution and to do the safest thing for you. Inside the operating room, we use what's called multimodal anesthesia. And what that means is that we're using multiple medications and methods to help improve your pain control during the procedure and after the procedure, while also reducing any unwanted or undesirable side effects. And you can see here that for hip replacement, your anesthesia plan is going to be spinal anesthesia, MAC or twilight sedation, and BEKK, which is a numbing medicine injected directly into your hip during surgery. The knee replacement anesthesia plan is the same, except you have that nerve block as well that we just discussed. Now, most people, when I say spinal anesthesia, get really anxious. But let me assure you that this is the very best way to do this procedure. We'll talk about what exactly happens in the process, and then we'll talk about the benefits and why we do it. 
So let's talk about what actually happens for the spinal. Prior to the spinal, your anesthesiologist is going to talk to you about it in pre-op. So even after the video today, if you have additional questions, they'll be happy to answer those for you before you go in for surgery. Once you get into the operating room, they will sit you on the side of the bed. There'll be a nurse that holds onto your shoulders facing you to kind of steady you because remember, you're going to be getting sedated. So they'll give you that sedation medicine. And then our anesthesiologist is going to clean off your skin. They'll inject numbing medicine next to the area where they'll do the spinal. And then they'll do the main injection. And remember, it's just a one-time injection and they come right back out of your back. The whole process takes usually less than five minutes, typically closer to just two or three minutes to get it done. It's very fast and very easy. After they have completed that spinal procedure, they're going to lay you down onto the operating bed. They will put some headphones over your ears with your favorite music. And then they're going to start the actual sleeping medicine, the actual anesthesia for the procedure. Your nurse anesthetist who works with the anesthesia doctor will monitor you the entire time. They make sure that if you start to have any pain or they need to make any adjustments, that they are doing that quickly in ensuring that you stay comfortable. Now, we've discussed all of the aspects of the spinal, and the question comes, why is it important? Why do we need to do it? Well, first of all, the spinal numbs you from the waist down for about three hours, and that means that during the surgery, you don't have any pain whatsoever. And since you don't have any pain, we don't have to give you strong narcotic pain medicine like morphine, fentanyl, Dilaudid, those types of things, because you're not hurting. And since we don't have to do those strong pain medicines, we actually don't have to put you in that deep, deep sleep where you have a big, long tube down your throat and have to let a machine breathe for you. So since you have the spinal, you're actually able to breathe on your own during the surgery. You'll just require a little bit of oxygen in your nose or over your face, and that should be sufficient. Now that lighter form of anesthesia can be compared to when you go to get a colonoscopy done, if you've ever had one. It's the same type of medicine that they use, except you'll be in a little bit of a deeper sleep. Typically, you have an easier time waking up, and it also decreases your risk of nausea and vomiting after surgery because we're not having to use those gases like we normally would. Another benefit is when you get to recovery, you're not immediately in a ton of pain. If you had done the procedure without a spinal, you would hurt as soon as you get to recovery. But when you have a spinal... Usually, you still have some numbness in your legs when you get to the recovery room, and that spinal will gradually fade. So you'll be able to tell your nurses, hey, my knee is starting to ache. It's like a three. And then your nurse will say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just give you a pain pill, or I'm going to give you a muscle relaxer. We're going to try to do those things so that we don't have to give you the really strong pain medicine that can make you feel nauseated. Some final notes about the operating room. At the end of the surgery, they will inject some numbing medicine into the operative area. You may hear that called BEK or B-E-K-K, and that's just a mixture of numbing medicine, pain medicine, and anti-inflammatory medicine that gets injected into the surrounding area. That lasts for about 24 hours and helps provide pain relief to get you home and get on your pain medicine regimen. Your incision is usually closed either with stitches, steri strips, or a special type of skin glue. Now, it'll be stitched on the inside. I'm merely talking about the top of your skin. Your dressing is water resistant, so it'll either look like a big waterproof band aid or it will be a piece of gauze with a clear plastic adhesive bandage over top. 
If you are a knee patient, they will place an ACE bandage over your knee and put that ice machine on there as well if you brought one with you or if we're providing one for you. As surgery is finishing up and they're waking you up and transferring you to the bed, the surgeon will call your support person and let them know how the procedure went. Now this is important because during this time, your support person can do whatever they want. They can sit in our lobby, they can sit in the car, they can go shopping or go home if your home is within 30 to 45 minutes of the facility. And then when the surgeon calls, that's a good indicator for them to go ahead and start heading back this way if they've left the facility. Usually your nurse will call you about 30 minutes or so after you get that call from the surgeon to let them know that you are in recovery and you're awake and going to be able to talk to them. And then they'll let your support person come back and be with you. In the recovery room, your nurse will typically stay with you for the first 45 minutes. That time will include monitoring you closely, making sure that your blood pressure is okay, that you're waking up okay. It also includes bringing your support person back to recovery and going over discharge instructions, any last minute instruction from your surgeon, answering any questions, etc. After that first 45 minutes, typically you are feeling pretty good. Usually it doesn't take you very long to wake up from this type of sedation. So at that point, your nurse will set you guys up for lunch, and then we're going to give you guys your privacy. Really, all we're waiting on at that point is for your legs to wake up. Now remember, I said that the spinal will last for about three hours. Usually, you're going to have some numbness still when you get to recovery. Now, sometimes we'll have people come out of the operating room and they're already able to wiggle everything and they have good feeling. And other times we have people that can't move their legs at all. And that all just really depends on how quickly you are able to metabolize that numbing medicine. So if you are one of those people that has no movement or feeling when you get to recovery, I assure you it's very normal and it just takes time to go away. So once we've set you up for lunch, we are going to close the door or pull the curtain and leave you guys alone. If we were to sit in there with you, we'd just be staring at each other because we just need a little bit more time for those legs to wake up. Your nurse or some of the other nurses will check in on you about every 20 minutes or so. They'll be asking questions like, can you wiggle your toes for me? Can you lift your legs off the bed? Is your bottom still feeling numb? Are you having any pain? And we're just assessing where that spinal is. If it's starting to wear off, if it's worn off completely and we're ready to stand up, etc. Once everything has worn off and you're ready to walk, your nurse will sit you up on the side of the bed. They'll disconnect you from everything except your IV. We'll put a special belt around your waist so we can hold on to you properly. We'll put some non-skid socks on your feet and then we'll put your walker in front of you. We do keep your gown on, but if you want to put pants on, you certainly can. We'll stand you up for the first time and pull your pants up if you're putting pants on and just have you stand there for a minute. If you feel really dizzy, we'll immediately sit you back down and lay you back down in the bed and give you some more time to wake up. But most people feel really good and are ready to rock and roll. Most of the time, they really have to get to the bathroom, so that is a big motivator. Your nurse will walk with you for the entire time for this first walk at the facility. They will walk you out to the restroom, and then you will complete the rest of your activities in order to be discharged. So in order to be discharged from BASC, you have to be able to walk up and down our hallway, up and down a set of physical therapy steps, which includes like two steps up and three steps down, and you have to pee for us. And we really don't have a time limit on that. So if it takes you an hour and a half to complete all of that and you feel ready to go home, 
we'll let you go home. If it takes you five hours to complete all of that, it takes you five hours. There's really no time constraint on that, and we've had people all in between that time range. But the typical time for discharge is usually two to three hours after you get to recovery. So if your surgery starts at 7.30 and we expect you to be out in recovery by about 9.30, I would expect you're going to be discharged around noon. Now those specific times are listed in the paperwork I sent you in that email, so make sure you're referring to that and that you know what to expect. At any time in the recovery room, if you start feeling pain or experiencing nausea, please let your nurse know as soon as possible so we can treat that early and avoid an extended length of stay. This is another slide like we had before that shows you your surgery day timeline. Please pause the video if you would like to read through what I expect of you and what you can expect from us on the day of surgery. For our final section of the class, we're going to talk about navigating a successful recovery. So these are the things that you need to do in order to get back to the life that you want after surgery. The most important thing and the best way to ensure success is going to be staying active consistently after surgery. I cannot stress that enough. If you do not get up and move, you will have problems after surgery. So why is it important? Walking helps reduce joint stiffness and pain. If you are having a lot of pain and stiffness now, you know that it's usually worst first thing in the morning. But usually that stiffness kind of eases up just a little bit as the day goes on, and that's because we're getting up and we're moving and we're getting everything loosened up. Walking and exercise also helps strengthen your weakened muscles. For surgery, they usually have to pull on muscles, and that can cause them to feel really weak. And so exercise and walking really helps to remedy that. It also improves your gait. If your hip or knee is in really bad condition before surgery, you're likely limping around quite a bit. And after surgery, you'll have to learn how to walk again without that limp, and that can take some adjusting. You may even have some pain in the non-operative side or in your back as everything readjusts back to normal. Walking helps prevent blood clots from forming, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but it keeps those leg muscles pumping and helps the blood flow. Walking consistently does decrease your recovery time and also decreases the risk of needing future surgeries. So if you do not get up and walk, scar tissue is going to build up in that joint and you may have to come back in for a surgery to loosen up all of that scar tissue. And it's usually not very fun for you when you wake up. So that is why staying active is so, so important. Now, it's also important to remember that you've got to find that good balancing act of staying active but not overdoing it. And that's a hard line to find. But I have a guide that can help you understand what might be a good place to start for you. So your optimal home schedule, or what I would recommend, on surgery day, rest. You've had anesthesia. You've had a lot going on in the day. Your body is tired. It needs some recuperation time. When you are awake, I want you to do ankle pumps, and ankle pumps are where you push your foot down like you're pushing on a gas pedal, and then bring your toes back up towards your head, and just do that at least 20 times every hour while you're awake. It is certainly okay to get up and walk and move around on that day of surgery, but be cautious. Whether you had knee replacement or hip replacement, you have numbing medicine in your joint that is helping you with pain control, and you've probably already taken a pain pill as well. So you're probably feeling pretty good, but you may not feel like that tomorrow. So 
if you decide to ferociously clean the house, you're going to regret that the next day because you have overdone it. So just be cautious with your pain levels and make sure that that doesn't trick you. Starting the day after surgery, I want you to get up and walk with your walker every hour that you're awake for five to ten minutes at a time. Now it's important that you stick to just five to ten minutes. Remember that your numbing medicine can last up to 24 hours. So again, it's important that you don't let that pain relief from the numbing medicine fool you. You want to be consistent with just 5 to 10 minutes so that you don't overdo it. I typically recommend staying on that schedule every hour for 5 to 10 minutes for the first few days. And then after that, you can increase your activity level however you would like. I wouldn't go down on your activity level, but if you want to increase it some, then you certainly can. As far as moving on in your mobility and what all you can or cannot do, it's really based on your tolerance and your pain level. You're going to use pain as your guide and make sure that you are listening to your body. You're going to have to experiment with your tolerance and how long you are able to do certain activities as time passes. Now, as you do move on and get stronger and do more and more activity, ice is going to be your friend for weeks and weeks and weeks after surgery. So ice is important at the beginning, and we'll talk about it more in a minute, but it's going to even be important as you move on through time. Make sure that you communicate with physical therapy. Physical therapy is a really great resource, and to get the most out of that, you need to make sure that you are communicating with them about any difficulties or questions that you have. One more thing about moving on. It's important to note that most people won't feel quote-unquote normal for about six months after surgery. And that varies for everyone. It could be as long as a year or it could be shorter. Don't be discouraged at the timing of things. And keep in mind that even three months down the road, you may still be having to use ice, use some Tylenol or Advil every once in a while. And that's all normal. It takes time for your body to adjust to a big change like this. Like I said a moment ago, physical therapy is going to be a really great resource for you after surgery. Now, I would recommend that you take a pain pill about an hour before you're supposed to get there, especially for those first few sessions, because you want to make sure that you are getting the best quality work in while you're there and that you're not getting halfway through and then you're not able to continue because your pain is way too out of control. And again, make sure that you are communicating with your physical therapist. Speak up if something doesn't feel right or if you're having a specific issue at home like getting upstairs or, you know, getting in and out of the car. They're there to help you with those things. When you're doing exercises at home, it's really important to stay consistent. Now, when I think about physical therapy recommendations, a lot of times they'll say, here's 10 exercises, and I want you to do 20 repetitions of each exercise two times a day. Well, that's 200 exercises each time you do it. That, to me, can feel really overwhelming. So what I would recommend instead of 200 exercises at 10 o'clock and then 200 exercises before you go to bed, I would recommend spreading those exercises out over the entire day if you're able to. So for example, if you wake up at 8 o'clock, you get up, go to the bathroom, do your hourly walk, and then right before you sit down, do 20 repetitions of two exercises. The next hour, you get up and walk and then do another one to two exercises, 20 repetitions each. If you do something every single hour like that and take it in little bite-sized chunks, you are going to be more likely to stick to it and do really well. Now, you don't have to do it that way, but that's how I would do it if I were having this surgery. Let's talk about pain medicine. 
So a couple of just quick notes before we talk about timing and other important aspects of pain medicine. Make sure that you have the correct pharmacy on file with your surgeon. Or if you're not sure, you can call the nurse before surgery and just double check. Either way, it's really, really important that you know where that pain medicine is going to be sent. Typically, your surgeon will prescribe oxycodone for you after surgery. If you have an allergy to oxycodone or are intolerant to it in some way, please let me know or let your surgeon know so that we can help take care of that. If, for example, oxycodone just makes you a little nauseated, your surgeon may prescribe an anti-nausea medicine like Zofran or Finergan to take along with that medicine. Or if you have a really bad reaction to oxycodone, they may prescribe something a little bit different that's similar that you can take. Do not skip your pain medicine if it will sacrifice activity. Remember what I said at the beginning, movement is the most important thing that you can do. Staying active is so, so important. And to be honest, and we're going to talk about risk of addiction and such here in just a minute, but suffice it to say, I would rather you take your pain medicine, even if it makes you super loopy, so that you can walk every hour than for you to sit on the couch and say, I'm hurting really bad, but I'm afraid of pain medicine and I don't want to take it because I don't like the way it makes me feel. And it's time for me to get up and walk, but I can't walk because I'm hurting so bad. So I'm just going to sit here. That is the worst thing you could do. So please remember that this medicine was intended for major surgery like this, and it is expected that you will need to take it for the first two to three days after surgery. So make sure you're taking it early and that you're taking it consistently so that we can ensure that you are moving like you're supposed to move. Let's talk about a pain medicine schedule and plan. Now, on surgery day, if you are hurting before you leave the surgery center, and it's likely that you will have some pain, our goal is to get your pain either at the level that you came in at or below. So if you came in at a 6, we want your pain to be a 6 or below for you to go home. But if your pain is a 4 or 5 when you're ready to be discharged or we're seeing that in the recovery room your pain is starting to creep up, we will go ahead and give you a pain pill at the surgery center. That afternoon when you get home, you are welcome to take more pain medicine when it's time and if you need it. However, occasionally we will have people that walk out of the surgery center and have zero pain. It is not very common, but it does happen sometimes. So if that is you, and if you did not require any medicine the rest of the day after you got home, you need to start taking your pain medicine before you go to bed at the very latest. And then what I want you to do is have your support person set an alarm for every six hours or whatever it says on the bottle, and then they're going to wake you up at that six hour mark and they're going to give you another pain pill unless you can't open your eyeballs or have a conversation with them. They need to give you that pain medicine. You're going to keep it in your system consistently every six hours or whatever the bottle says until the afternoon after surgery. You want to make sure that you've gone a full 24 hours after surgery started before you stop staying on a schedule. If, for example, your surgery started at 9 o'clock, I would take that pain medicine consistently every 6 hours or whatever it says on the bottle until around noon or so. By noon or early afternoon, We know that the medicine that was injected into your joint, which only lasts 24 hours, has completely worn off, and then you can make a well-educated decision about how much pain medicine you want to take. For most people, that's going to be 
ooh, yeah, I do need to take it every six hours. I, I'm going to need to do that. Some people realize at that point that it's not hurting that bad, and they may want to start cutting those pain pills in half. Or, and this is extremely rare, you may decide that you don't need the pain medicine at all. For the majority of our patients, though, you're going to have to take that pain medicine as prescribed for the first two to three days after surgery before you can consider weaning off of that pain medicine. There are some common side effects and risks when it comes to narcotic pain medicine. One of these is constipation. Constipation can be a major issue after surgery because pain medicine will constipate you and also anesthesia will constipate you. So it's important that you have something at home that you can use. I would personally recommend that you get something like Miralax or Colace that's really gentle on your system and that you start taking that the day after surgery and take it every day until you have a normal bowel movement or until you feel well regulated. You can always contact us or speak with your pharmacist if you are continuing to have issues with constipation. Nausea is another common issue with pain medicine and it's also common with other medicines like antibiotics and such. To prevent nausea, it's important that you do take medicine with food when you take it. So I would recommend buying some saltine crackers or some other type of small snack that you can stick on your nightstand so that when you wake up to take pain medicine, you have something right there you can take it with to avoid nausea. Now, if that doesn't work and you are still experiencing nausea, you can always call your surgeon and request some anti-nausea medication to take along with that pain medicine. Now, the most common concern I hear about pain medicine is the risk of addiction and dependence. People are terrified of that, and understandably so. It's a major problem in our society, right? However, I want you to remember that you are taking this for a reason. You just had major surgery, and it's important that you take your narcotic pain medicine. Of course, addiction and dependence is always a risk, but if you have a plan in mind that says, okay, I know that I need to take this consistently for the first two or three days, and then I know after that I need to start trying to wean off of it. Now, things that we can do to help wean off of the pain medicine is to use other medications along with the pain pills to assist in the weaning process. If you're a patient of Dr. Burton's, Dr. Burton has a really, really good pain medication protocol. So he includes a lot of medications that are non-narcotic into your regimen, and that helps to reduce the amount of narcotic pain medicine that you have to take. However, for everyone else, medicines that can assist in weaning off of the pain medicine are going to include NSAIDs, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But those are things like ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, things like that. Also, muscle relaxers or even nerve pain medications like gabapentin or Lyrica can really help as well. When you go to wean off the medicine, you can start cutting pills into halves or cutting them into quarters and do it that way. You can also start spacing out your times. So maybe instead of every six hours, plan to take that medicine every eight hours and see how that does for you. By the one week mark, I usually expect you to be down to just once or twice a day on your pain medicine. And if you have any further issues with weaning off of your pain medicine, please call and let me know. I'm happy to help you come up with a game plan on how to get off of that medicine and talk to you about alternatives and such. In regards to NSAIDs, these are medicines that can really help you with pain control after surgery, and it can also help you in the weaning process. Sometimes your surgeon will actually prescribe you a prescription strength form of an NSAID 
Those include things like meloxicam, Mobic, Celebrex, Celecoxib, or Diclofenac, and there are others that I didn't list here. There are certain patients who may need to avoid NSAIDs, such as patients that have kidney disease or diabetic patients. A good rule of thumb is to follow whatever you've been told. So if your diabetes doctor or your general practitioner ever told you that you shouldn't take ibuprofen, then you need to refrain from taking ibuprofen during this time. Now, medicines that are NSAIDs are safe to take along with your narcotic pain medicine, so the oxycodone. You can actually take them at the exact same time. They both work to reduce pain, but they work in different ways. Narcotic pain medicine helps block pain signals in your brain, while the anti-inflammatory medicine actually reduces inflammation at the site. So they are safe to take at the same time if needed. However, I would recommend that you get on an alternating schedule, and I have this mock schedule made up for you. So let's assume that your oxycodone is prescribed for every six hours as needed. Well, you can also take ibuprofen 400 milligrams every six hours as needed based on what the bottle says. So let's try to alternate those. Let's say you take your oxycodone at six o'clock in the morning. Well, I would try to take some ibuprofen around nine o'clock, three hours later. Three hours after that at noon, it will have been six hours since your last oxycodone. So you can go ahead and take one of those. Three hours later at 3 o'clock, it will have been six hours since your last dose of ibuprofen, etc., etc. And so what that does is during those first few days where pain can be the most troublesome, you are able to keep something in your system every three hours instead of having to wait every six hours. Now, if you did get prescribed one of those prescription strength NSAIDs, those are usually just once a day. So just stick with that. Those work really well. But if your surgeon didn't prescribe you anything like that, I would recommend implementing ibuprofen or a leave into your schedule and just following the bottle's instructions. If you ever have any questions about medications, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the other joint replacement coordinators or discuss it when we call for your scheduled check-ins. Other methods of pain control, when in doubt, you want to think of rice. So that's going to be rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And we're going to go over each of those. So rest and icing. If it is time for you to get up and walk and your pain is six or above, I don't want you to get up and walk. If your pain is out of control and you walk, it's just going to make it worse and it's going to be harder to wrangle that pain level back down. So instead, I want you to lay back, do your ankle pumps so that we are still helping to prevent blood clots and continue your other pain measures, taking pain medication, icing, elevating, all of that good stuff. Make sure that you are utilizing those other methods because we don't want you resting for a long time without moving as that can cause issues further down the line. Ice is also really, really important. I would recommend every hour for 20 minutes or as tolerated. The biggest thing is to protect your skin. You need to be watching it every few minutes to make sure that your skin is not getting too irritated or damaged. That's especially true for the first 24 hours as that numbing medicine is working in the operative area. So if you have hip replacement and you put an ice pack on your hip and you forget about it, it could cause frostbite because you can't feel if your skin is starting to hurt or if something's starting to be damaged because you have that numbing medicine there. So just make sure you're checking your skin frequently. And that goes for the ice machine as well. 
There are no true guidelines for the ice machine on how long you should use it or when to take it off. I personally wouldn't sleep with it on, and I think you need to be checking your skin under there every hour to make sure that you're not damaging your skin. Compression and elevation is also really helpful for knee replacement patients. Compression is provided either by an ACE bandage or by the TED hose that are placed on your legs. It is important that whichever it is, you wear it consistently. That's going to help to reduce swelling in the area, which will in turn help reduce pain and inflammation. Elevation can be helpful as well. Remember, if you are a knee patient, when you elevate your knee, you need to keep your leg straight as much as possible. After surgery, you don't want to place a pillow directly under your knee. That pillow needs to actually be under your ankle. The reasoning is if you have a pillow under your knee and you keep that knee in a bent position, scar tissue can build up in that bent position and you will have trouble straightening your leg out as the days go on. So it's important when you're resting that you try to keep that leg straight. Now the exceptions to that rule would be if your pain is 9 out of 10 and bending your knee helps it feel better then by all means put a pillow under that knee. That's fine. Another exception would be sleeping. It's great if you can sleep with your legs straight, but if you are like me and you have to curl up into a little ball to sleep, then that is fine. Sleeping is so important to your recovery, and so I really want to make sure that you are sleeping adequately. For both knee and hip patients, it is important that you keep your leg parallel to the floor. So if you're a hip replacement and you're sitting in the recliner, I just want your feet propped up. If you keep your foot on the floor, there's a potential for swelling to go down into that lower leg. So you want to keep that foot up in the bed or in the chair as much as possible. Now it's time to talk about your dressing, so your bandage over your incision. So for all patients except Dr. Shell's patients, your dressing when you come out of the operating room is water resistant. For hip patients, that will be visible immediately. For knee patients, you will have an ACE bandage wrapped around your knee, so you may not be able to visualize that dressing, but it is there when you're ready to shower. You can shower two days after surgery and get that dressing wet. Just don't pick at it, scrub on it really hard, make sure you have a way to sit down in the shower, and that you try to not do anything rough with that incision site and dressing site. You cannot take a tub bath while the dressing is on or after the dressing is removed until you've been cleared by your surgeon. Now for Dr. Shell's patients, you're going to actually keep your ACE bandage on for two days after surgery. You do not have an adhesive dressing over your incision. You just have a bunch of gauze and an ACE bandage over top. You will be provided with one or two bandages that you can put over your knee when you're ready to shower. So two days after surgery, when you're ready to take a shower, I would remove your ACE bandage and gauze, and then you're going to place that water-resistant bandage over the incision, and then you can shower. You do not want to get that incision wet yet, not two days after surgery. You want to keep that protected. Typically, for all patients, we have two types of bandages that you can see in the pictures here. The top one is a piece of gauze, basically, with a tegaderm dressing over it. That clear plastic tape is like the stuff that you put over your IV site. And then that bottom dressing is called an Aquacell dressing, and it is just similar to a waterproof Band-Aid. It's sticky on all four sides. Dr. Shell's patients will be applying the top dressing, and that comes all in one piece, though. So it's still like a big waterproof bandage, but it's going to look like the dressing on the top. As far as drainage on the dressing and our expectations there, it is normal to have small areas of blood 
or slow oozing that happens. If you're seeing a quarter size drop of dark red on your dressing, that is nothing to get concerned about. Now, what I would get concerned about is if blood saturates over half of your dressing, you would want to call and let either your surgeon or your coordinator know. Or if you had any weird drainage, like green or yellow, you definitely want to call. As far as removing the dressing, Dr. Shell's patients, as I said before, you're going to remove that ACE bandage and gauze two days after surgery and then place that water-resistant bandage over the incision. Seven days after that, you will be able to remove your dressing completely. So that's a total of nine days after your surgery. For Dr. Lawrence's patients, do not remove your dressing. You will keep it on until your follow-up appointment with Dr. Lawrence. For all other patients and all other surgeons, you're going to remove your dressing seven days after surgery. Once that dressing is removed, you don't have to cover it back up with anything. So you can leave it open to the air without a dressing on it, but you do need to protect it. After that, you can shower with regular soap. I recommend still using that dial soap and that you wash that incision every single day. Even if you don't take a full shower, wash that incision with dial soap to keep it clean. Do not use your CHG soap. And remember we talked about that earlier. That CHG soap that we did before surgery can actually break down some of the adhesive in either the skin glue or the steri strips, so make sure you're not using that, only dial soap. Avoid any ointments or creams to the incision, and then remember you can't submerge that incision under water until you've been cleared by your surgeon, so showers only at this point. We also want to make sure we're avoiding infection by not doing any dirty activities like gardening or kneeling down on the ground when you've got shorts on if you're a knee patient. And you're also welcome to cover your incision back up if you need extra protection. Sometimes the incision will get irritated from your clothes rubbing up against it. If that's the case, you can put a dressing on it. And remember, we don't want your pet licking your incision. So make sure if it needs to be covered back up or if you need to make sure you're wearing long pants, do what you need to do. But they do not need to have access to that area in addition to that, just make sure that you're keeping the area clean. You know, change your pants and your underwear regularly, showering every day with that dial soap. Just be smart about it. Now, bruising and swelling and irritation, that's all a normal part of the process. Even if you do everything exactly the way you're supposed to do, you're going to have bruising and you're going to have swelling. So the severity of it depends on you as a person and your medical history. If you're on strong blood thinners, you're obviously going to have a lot of bruising. Or you may just be like me and bruise easily anyway. So some people who have hip replacement might be bruised on their backside. They may be bruised all the way down to their knee. And that's not uncommon. It does happen. If you're ever concerned, of course, you can reach out to one of our joint coordinators, send me a picture of it, but do know that bruising and swelling is expected. And your best treatments for swelling is going to be ice for hip patients and knee patients. And then for knee patients, it's going to be compression with the ACE bandage and keeping that knee elevated. And again, just call or text me if you have concerns about that. Now let's talk about those complications and reasons that you'd want to call me. Our complication rate here at Baptist Ambulatory Surgery Center is very low, and we've done a lot of things to address any issues that have arisen over the past several years, but I do want to make you aware of what complications could happen, what you need to look for, and what you would do if they did happen. So let's talk about bleeding a little bit. We've already said that a quarter-sized amount of dark red drainage is completely normal, but if blood was saturating over half of your dressing, or if you were bleeding through your ACE bandage, that's something you'd want to call us about. 
Now, those things, while they can be concerning, are not medical emergencies unless you see that blood growing while you're watching it and it won't stop. If you are seeing that, of course, you would need to go to the ER or what have you. But if it's just some bleeding that you see that isn't getting any bigger on the dressing, I would not go to the ER for that. I would call your surgeon or call your coordinator and get into either an acute care clinic or go to the clinic that your surgeon is associated with to get that dressing changed. If you are seeing that abnormal bleeding, wrap it with a towel and apply gentle pressure and then just call your coordinator or your surgeon and we will likely tell you to go to an acute care clinic or the clinic that your surgeon is associated with. If you're having that abnormal bleeding that does not stop, then I would go to the nearest emergency room. You can certainly go to the clinic if it's open and if it's nearby. Otherwise, you you may have to go to the ER. But again, I've never had a patient where this was an issue, but I do want you to know what to do if it does happen. And remember that you can call me or text me during the day or even in the evening if you need to. And then if it's a 2 o'clock in the morning issue, your surgeon's office has a physician on call during that time. So you can always speak with them. You also want to watch for circulation issues. This would be pretty rare for a knee or hip replacement. But obviously, if you saw discoloration of your toes, such as your toes turning blue, or if they got really, really cold compared to the other foot, started all of a sudden being really tingly or having shocking pains in your toes, then that would be concerning. Make sure that, first of all, those symptoms are only happening on one side. For example, if your toes are really, really cold on the operative side, but they're also really, really cold on the non-operative side, then that's nothing to worry about. We want to compare it to the other foot. But if it's still looking abnormal, then you want to call your surgeon's office. Okay, one of the big things we want to watch for is infection. So the timing of infection is usually a few weeks after surgery, which is typically not what people think of, but it is something that we want to watch for several weeks after surgery. And that's why we need to continue to keep your incision clean and dry even after that dressing is removed to help protect you. Speaking of the timing, people are often concerned about fever, which is understandable. However, a low-grade fever right after surgery during the first few days is completely normal. So if you run a fever of 99.8, 100.3, I wouldn't get super worked up about that unless you're having other symptoms or other problems. And then certainly call your joint coordinator or your surgeon's office. Other symptoms of infection other than high fevers is going to be angry redness or streaking around the incision and any drainage that looks bad like a green or yellow color or smells bad. And then the last complication we're going to talk about is blood clots. So let's talk about why they happen. Your body is more prone to forming blood clots after you've had a major stressor or major trauma. And this includes a big surgery like joint replacement. Blood clots can also happen if you are not staying mobile, if you're not getting up to walk. The movement of your leg muscles as you walk helps to pump that blood up back to your heart. If your leg muscles are not moving as much as they normally would, that blood is going to move slower and it's going to have more of a chance to clot together and cause issues. Complications of untreated blood clots. So if you got a blood clot in your leg and you didn't notice it, can actually cause heart attack, stroke. You can get blood clots in your lungs. And all of that is going to cause hospitalization. So we don't want any of that. So the things we're doing to prevent blood clots is you're going to be taking aspirin after surgery. On the next slide, I have a list of each surgeon and what their protocol is on aspirin. So I'll let you take a look at that in just a minute. 
Aspirin thins your blood a little bit and helps prevent those blood clots from forming. We're also doing our frequent walking, so every hour while you're awake, that helps prevent blood clots. If you're unable to get up and walk for any reason, whether you're in a lot of pain or you're riding in the car, I want you doing frequent ankle pumps. And you can also do quad sets and glute squeezes, which is where you simply lay down or go in a reclining position and you tighten up all of the muscles on the top of your thighs and the muscles on your backside, hold for five seconds and then release. Just do that multiple times. Even for hip patients, just sitting on the side of the bed with your feet dangling down and swinging your foot out and back in towards the bed can help with blood clot prevention as well. Dr. Smith and Dr. Sarb currently like for you to use TED hose after surgery. And TED hose are special stockings that provide compression which improves circulation and helps prevent blood clots. So they're like big compression stockings, almost like pantyhose. And I have a slide on that that you'll see in just a minute about how to wear those TED hose. So if you do what you're supposed to do, you shouldn't get a blood clot. However, I want you to know what one looks like just in case. So a blood clot usually looks like an area of abnormal bruising with two or more of the following. Either a different discoloration compared to other areas, so it may be more purplish or reddish than your bruising in other spots. It may be really warm compared to other areas. It may be really swollen compared to other areas or have a big knot in the middle of it. Or it may just be super painful to touch it or when you move that muscle. If you have any two of those symptoms, I want you to call me or have your physical therapist look at it. Most of the time, it's just normal bruising from your surgery, but we do want to certainly be cautious about this. Remember that it is normal to have bruising and swelling around your incision site and even leading away from your incision site. So again, if you had knee replacement, you might have continuous bruising that goes all the way down to your ankle, and that's not unexpected. But if you had something isolated up on your thigh or on the other leg that had some heat in it compared to other areas and had a big lump in it, then that's definitely something that we need to address. Again, both infection and blood clots are things that can happen even weeks after surgery, so it is something that you need to be vigilant about even after that initial period. This slide looks at the different surgeons' preferences for aspirin and dosing, so you can pause the video at this time and look at that. I've also included the specific information for your surgeon in the paperwork that was included with the email that I sent you. A little more on TED hose. So Dr. Smith and Dr. Sarb currently like for us to use TED hose on their patients, both hip replacement and knee replacement. Instructions for TED hose. Both Dr. Sarb and Dr. Smith want you to wear your TED hose for three weeks after surgery. You need to wash those TED hose regularly, and you're going to remove those TED hose to shower and to sleep. So you're going to be removing them at least once a day. They can be a little bit of a struggle to get on and off, but if you are a female or have a female in your life, they have done something similar to this in their lifetime, I can almost guarantee you. So I'm sure that that experience will help. We are just about finished with the class here, but I just wanted to wrap this up with a quick shopping list that you can refer to. Some things that are needed for surgery that you need to go ahead and look at purchasing. Dial soap for your showers prior to surgery and to clean the incision after surgery. The correct dose of aspirin if you don't already have that. Advil or Aleve for after surgery if you're not already on a strong anti-inflammatory medication like Meloxicam, Mobic, Celebrex, Diclofenac, those things. An ice pack 
or an ice machine if you've decided not to get your ice machine from Basque, a cane if you've not already received one, a template for taking medications and making sure that you are staying on time. I have provided you with my own template in the email that I sent you, but you are free to look around on the internet and find your own as well, or just make your own if you'd like. And then make sure that you've bought some type of small snack to take with your medications. So again, saltine crackers, something small and light like that, just so that you don't get nauseated when you take your medicines. And then a short wish list. These are just recommended for surgery, but you don't have to have them. Again, the shower chair can be helpful, raised toilet seat, the grabber that I showed you, and that car door handle. Now, something that I like to always mention is if you are in need of a shower chair because you have no other options at home, but you are unable to afford it at this time, there are church ministries that exist here in Nashville and possibly wherever you live as well, where they share medical equipment that can be cleaned like shower chairs or raised toilet seats. Typically, those church programs allow you to take the medical devices for free with the expectation that you will return them once you have recuperated so that other people can use it. If you need assistance in finding a program that does this, please reach out to me and let me know, and I'll be happy to help coordinate that for you. If you have any questions about anything we talked about today, please reach out to me and let me know. If you are coming in to get your blood work drawn at Basque and to pick up your goodie bag, then certainly write down any questions that you have and we will go over those together when you come to see us. If you're not going to be coming in for your labs, but you're getting your labs done elsewhere, or if you live really far away, Please reach out to me if you have any questions. You know that you can always call or text or email me if you have any concerns. I'll be happy to help you with those. So final steps before we get to surgery day. We've completed the class. Let's talk about the very last things we need to do to get you ready. So if you haven't already, you're going to go for your blood draw and your nasal swab. Now again, you may either be doing that at the Baptist Ambulatory Surgery Center facility where we are, or if you live really far away, I may have coordinated that with a local hospital or clinic, but you will need to get that done as soon as possible so we can make sure that we have your records on file. I will be sending you a link to the menu for Jimmy John's, and I want you to pick out what you and your support person would like for lunch on the day of surgery can either email me back or send me a text message with what you want and I will get that ordered for you. You need to buy the items needed for your surgery so go back and look at that shopping list. We need to make sure that you've got those. Make sure you've prepared your home and that you've practiced with your walker and finally Trust yourself and trust the process. If you got all the way to the end here with me then you are ready. Remember, you will always have this video to come back and reference if you need it, and you can always reach out to us or talk to us about any specific questions during your normal scheduled calls. Thank you again for choosing to have your joint replacement surgery here with us at Baptist Ambulatory Surgery Center. I'm excited to help you navigate your joint replacement journey and get you on the road to recovery. We'll see you soon.